Hey, what's up everybody? We want to welcome you to another episode of the Dreamers Pro Daily Recap, where we give you a recap of all of the hot topics that we covered that day. You can catch them in their long format and also catch it fully streaming for free on Apple Podcasts. So it seems like JJ Reddick has been making a lot of headlines uh, over the last two or three days now. Um, it really kicked off after his comments on his former head coach when he was a Los Angeles Clippers and Doc Rivers where he called him out on ES on ESPN first take <clears throat> because he was essentially saying that Doc Rivers is allergic to taking responsibilities for his own screw ups. So we had that. Then his son uh, responded to him on a later uh, show later that evening, responded to J.J. Redick. So what happened yesterday? J.J. Redick visits ESPN first take. And it seems like J.J. already has like his 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 predisposition is. I'm angry. I'm here to fight. And I'm like, I'm going to be having a screw face. Dance. Also, I got to ask <clears throat> why JJ Reddick, you go on these shows, you're always ready to fight somebody with the screw face. People are trying to make it lighthearted. You up there, ice grilling and type for what was he's not the only one that people like, I can't stand these dudes. Like, Oh, so we're going to think you're more serious or more of a serious person. If you walk around with a serious face. So therefore we think you're just like, cut it out, bro. Like, Relax, like you can smile. It's okay. Nothing, nothing's going, not, not, nothing's going to happen if you smile, right? You're not going to be less manly or nothing like that. Like, come on, what, what is this? But anyway, he was on there, and um, they're having this conversation. They were reacting to the things that uh, Kevin Durant was talking about in terms of his leadership, uh, and they were really discussing Kevin Durant's leadership. So initially, Stephen A. Smith went first, <clears throat> then followed by him. Uh, Chris Mad Dog Russo followed after him. And uh, when Mad Dog was talking, I didn't think he was saying anything that was offensive or anything like that. But they were showing J.J. Reddick's face and he seemed to be visibly upset because he disagreed. And then uh, when it came time for J.J. Reddick to respond, he went off. On, he went off essentially on this rant of the way sports media is being covered, how he doesn't like it. Why is it that um, these salacious hot takes are the things that get people clicking and get people talking. But if you talk about the X and O's of basketball, no, no one really wants to listen to that. So he, he started going off on that tangent there. And then what happened? I tuned into the Odd Couple yesterday, one of my favorite shows featuring Chris Broussard and Rob Parker. And Rob Parker has been on like this, I don't give a F kind of stuff. Like he's calling everything left, <coughs> excuse me, he's calling things out uh, left and right. He recently went at Adam Silver calling him the worst commissioner in the history uh, in the NBA and sports right now. And then yesterday, he was um, reacting to the comments that J.J. Reddick made on ESPN First Take. And during his monologue, man, he really went off on uh, J.J. Reddick because he felt like J.J. doesn't seem to understand the space that he is operating uh, within, right? And he really expanded on his thoughts. And even a caller called in and brought in, brought in some very, very sound points that we're going to play for you guys as well. And we're also going to include... Uh, the part where JJ Reddick essentially call out the media at large and the people for people and people the, for the way that they consume content. So for those of you who didn't hear that exchange, we want to play it for you now, and then we're going to come back and re react to everything that was said. So take a listen to what Rob, Rob Parker had to say here. It's when is it players' jobs to educate people on basketball? When did that become a thing? When did that become a thing? Isn't that our job? Isn't that our job? I'll answer. I'll I do answer that as my I'm, job. I'm, I'm, That's I'm, my job I'm, to educate people I'm letting, on basketball. I'm letting you speak, no, and then I, I'm, I'll I'm, answer. I, I'm, it's our job, Stephen A., to educate mm -hmm. people on basketball. It's okay. our job. And here's the reality. This is the okay. ecosystem we live in. I can do a okay. video on my podcast. I can do a video on my podcast where I break down the last nine games the Pelicans have used Zion Williamson as the primary ball handler and what type of actions that has led to. I looked it up this morning, 54,000 views on YouTube. But I want to call out a coach yesterday. Oh, that gets tens of millions of engagements. That's the ecosystem we live in. So do fans actually want to be educated or not? Mm -hmm. Do they? No, JJ Reddick, <laughs> what don't you understand? What don't you understand? All that coach speak and all this other stuff. People don't want to hear that. That's what coaches are into, Chris. How many times have we watched Charles Barkley, Chris? He is, is he breaking down the game? Never. He don't never even know half the players who are playing. <laughs> Come on. But they want to hear what Charles has to say right. about the personal. other stuff. Yeah. 
Yep. JJ, come on, man. Is this on? That You know what? Break it down on a basketball game. Tell me about the, 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 the screen and tell me about that in a game. But that's not what people tune in for. They want people's takes. What, what do you think of this? Uh, did you like the All-Star game? Didn't you like the All-Star game? Not any kind of technical mumbo-jumbo. Nobody wants to hear that. That's you trying to flex your muscles and tell us how smart you are with basketball. Chris, he's just missed the boat. He doesn't understand. It's not just that uh, people want you to rip people or whatever, and that's the only thing they care about. It's about your take on stuff, good, bad, or indifferent. That's what people. That's what you're up there for. He's asking Stephen A. Not, not, not technical and all that other stuff. There's a time and place for that. Those geeks, Chris, and those nerds who like that stuff, there's plenty of places for them to yeah, find those, it. Uh, those analytics guys, right. Last year, full of it. We, we, had, we, had, we went at him, and Chris, I think you'll remember, uh, when he basically told Laker fans to give up on the season. Remember right. when the Lakers got off to a bad start? And right. we were like, what, what, what do you mean give up 10 games in? Yeah, we, this should just be about LeBron, or blah, 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 blah. And, and guess what? The Lakers went, uh, what was that, uh, went to Conference the Western Finals. Conference Finals. Like, but like, you know what? So he was wrong. So no, what? I didn't you say wrong. That. I'm, I'm wrong. I'm, he made a take, though. That's the thing. For, he, that thing was a is, take. That wasn't no analysis. Is, that wasn't no breakdown. He had a take. Turned out to be wrong. But he's doing the same thing we all doing. Right. And my point is that it is about takes. And if he doesn't right. feel comfortable with doing takes, you need to get off that show. That, it's just that simple. Right. You can't sit there across from Stephen A and talk about this is BS. Like this show exactly. and what we do is BS. <laughs> if I'm Stephen A, like, I would have said, you know what, dude, then maybe you shouldn't be on the show. Steve, I'm, I, I mean, if you really are bothered by what it is that we do here, because this right. is what we do. And the last time I looked at the ratings and looked at how many viewers we get, it's way more than these other shows. What's up, Kev? God is good. Wonderful worship Wednesday, fellas. How yes, you doing? Yes, definitely. Look, the hot take culture was started with shows I grew up watching, you know, sports reporters. And, you know, I, I had a show uh, that I had, Kids Talk Sports. We auditioned. They said, you know, talk about a topic. We all have to talk about that topic. So it's a very ignorant take. It's uninformed. You have shows like Party Interruption that I watch you guys on with, with Will Bond and Kornheiser. And you had guys who made their careers on the hot takes. Jason Whitlock, uh, you got guys like Skip Bayless, um, you got athletes who are hot take artists like LaShawn yeah. McCoy, Draymond Green. They, they, they've watched the hot take culture and they've made a career off of it. So what he's saying, he's looking at his peers. Paul Pierce was a hot take guy. Just right. saying hot take takes. So it's, it's an ignorant, uninformed take. Look at your peers. They're making a career in podcasts off of that. This is a new format in media. It's so uninformed and it's a lazy, it's a lazy, lazy take. And it makes no sense. So you heard what you heard what um, Rob Parker had to say. I'm going to react to what he had to say, and what that caller um, had to say. I think Rob was annoyed with JJ Reddick because number one, he seems whiny, and number two, because JJ Reddick has this reluctance to take a position on things. If you listen to JJ Reddick talk about various things, for instance, on ESPN, he seldom takes a uh, a strong position on anything and whenever he does he usually produces a bad take you can go back to his larry burke comments you can go back to his bob Cousy comments if jj reddick was so sound at discussing basketball why did you have some of the greatest players to ever play the sport like dominique wilkins uh michael cooper uh uh, uh jerry west larry burke i think did larry burke call him out i'm not sure larry burke but, but, but um, bob Cousy and all these other guys came out and called uh, jj reddick out why these are all top 75 guys, Hall of Famers, all of that. They all called him out. Why? Because Dominique Wilkins and all of that. When J.J. Reddick said that the game in the 80s and the 90s wasn't that physical. This was the same J.J. Reddick that said it. Now, I want you guys to pay, pay attention to something. Those sound bites and those, 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 those comments that he made definitely benefited J.J. Reddick's podcast, number one. Number two. I want to get to the larger point that Rob Parker brought up, and I want to use that as a linchpin to just kind of go, go to my next point. He spoke about JJ going on ESPN first take. Let me make something crystal clear to you. <clears throat> I'm 
Before JJ Reddick got to ESPN, we did a show, you can go look it up in our archives, speaking about our excitement for JJ Reddick to get an opportunity to work at ESPN. We did that. But then when he got there, I quickly found out that this guy is pro player to, 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 to a nauseating extent. JJ Reddick went on ESPN. His podcast was doing certain numbers. He gets to ESPN and his podcast gets a significant boost. Why? Because whenever he had a blow up with Stephen A. Smith, whenever he would say this thing, whatever he, whenever he would say that thing, it would contribute to the success of his individual show. Make no mistake, anybody that has a podcast and you see them on ESPN First Take, they're also using that platforms as a means to promote their show. So to the point of JJ now questioning, why do we cover sports in the fashion that we do? Why is ESPN First Take and all these shows like this? The question you need to ask yourself is, what research did you do on ESPN First Take before you got there? Because that's always been what ESPN has been about. Hot takes, talking about what's happening, and not really the X's and O's. Who doesn't know this? So for JJ to come to this, all of to have this epiphany and say, I don't understand what this is all about. And like, bro, what are you talking? Don't play the victim when you directly benefit from being on ESPN first take. If you felt this way about the show and its direction and all of that stuff, why have you constantly been constantly attend uh, been attending that show, making appearances on that show? From my from the best of my knowledge, JJ Reddick is invited on the show by Stephen A. Smith because he's the head honcho of that show. Why do you go? Why don't you just say I don't want to be a part of this circus, and I'm not going to go because you know you know you're fully aware of everything that comes with the success of First Take and how it can impact your brand. Who are we kidding here? Who are we kidding? That's number one. Number two, I'm going to get to the point that the caller brought up about hot takes and all of that stuff. And the person I thought of immediately after he said that was Gilbert Arenas. Sports media now has turned into hot takes. Athletes are doing it left and right. Gilbert Arenas' new thing is, oh, uh, you know, uh, 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 Michael Jordan. I mean, is Michael Jordan ever that good? Is he really that good? And LeBron, blah, blah, blah. You bring in views and clicks. Hot takes after hot takes after hot takes after hot takes. Athletes are doing the very thing that you are complaining about journalists doing, they do the very same thing. They do the very same thing. Now, in terms of people not being interested <clears throat> in, uh, let me say, the X's and O's of basketball, first of all, let, let, let's just break it down to a molecular level here. You got to look at the audience and you got to look at your consumer, all right? You have kids that follow the NBA on social media and all of that stuff. But generally, the people that watch the NBA are people that can afford to pay to watch the NBA. I want you to follow this. And the people that pay to watch the NBA usually are using some of their disposable income to watch the games on TV by paying for the TV packages or going to the games to go sit down at those games. Now, all those people that you see attending those games, minus the kids, are not jobless. They have jobs, which means that a lot of these people have lives outside of just watching the NBA. So when they watch the NBA attend a basketball game, what are they going there for? They're going there for the entertainment value. They're not going there to sit through a lecture of the X's and O's of basketball and who bounced the first ball in this particular year and who did that. People are not interested in that. People want things summarized and they want things to be interesting and fun and entertainment. Nobody wants to attend basketball school when they tune in to watch the NBA. We're looking for an escape and usually for some form of entertainment. The same reason you go to a movie. If a movie gets a little bit too heavy and all of that, the most I can do is two hours. But if you expect me to do it every single day, you're not serious. JJ Reddick is fully aware of all of this. All of this. It's a human behavior going all the way back to the days of the gladiators. People like to be entertained with the big stories and the big drama. That's how it's always been. That's been the nature of human beings for whatever reason. For whatever reason. So for JJ to go on ESPN first take and make those comments about Doc Rivers the way that he did, if you're telling me that he was unaware of the reaction that he was going to get, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe him. But the, the part I just want to make crystal clear, when did JJ Reddick become the authority on how media, sports media is supposed to be conducted? When did that become a thing? Why is it that we have to listen to JJ Reddick basically dictate to us how we should conduct sports media? Why, why did that, when, does, when did he become the golden standard? 
J.J. Reddick is a person discussing sports from the vantage point of an athlete, given his views and opinions. But he likes to get into this thing where he's didactic and trying to basically dictate to people how they should do things. That's awfully arrogant of you. That's awfully, awfully arrogant of you. Why do we need to sit up here and conduct ourselves based on the J.J. Reddick method of doing things? Why do we need to do that? He seems very condescending and he seems like as if he's lecturing people half of the time. Does J J.J. Reddick... Okay. I think there's a misconception that exists out there in sports media. For whatever reason, I don't know why some athletes conduct themselves this way. Just because you know more about a sport that maybe the average viewer is not as versed in as you are, doesn't mean that these people are dumb or they don't do sophisticated things in their real lives. There are a lot of engineers that follow basketball. There are a lot of businessmen that follow basketball. There are a lot of very smart people that watch the NBA. The thing is, you want to get a tap on your shoulder and for somebody to give you a golden star for knowing your field. Why? If you walk into some of the offices of these bankers, these engineers, these, these, uh, these, these, these uh, what is it? These um, 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 people that are into construction and all of those stuff, if they took you through a day of their work, you wouldn't understand a damn thing of what they do. Not a damn thing. And no one will expect you to. You may have a general knowledge of it, but for damn sure you're not going to understand it on a deep level. At all. So why do you act like as if you're smarter than people just because you can explain a sport that you've been doing since you were a child? What, what, what is this? There's this misconception that NBA fans are stupid people in general, which is an ignorant position to take as myopic and as short-sighted. I think JJ is getting to the point where he's beginning to nauseate people with his point of views because he's always bitching and whining about something. He's always upset about something, whining and moaning and complaining about why don't they do this this way and why don't they do that that way. JJ, you do your own thing and let it be your own thing. Stop trying to dictate to people and all of that stuff. You're not the smartest guy in the room. You're like, come on, st like, st stop. You play basketball. You weren't building rocket ships. You didn't build Tesla. You didn't build Amazon. You play basketball. My, my, my boy, cut it out with all of this. Like you're talking down to people and educating people. Like enough is enough. And I'm, and I'm glad uh, that Rob Parker pushed back on him because he's getting a little bit nauseating. There are other people that I'd rather listen, talk, uh, listen to, talk, and talk basketball and listen to you. I listen to a lot of Kobe Bryant talk basketball, and a lot of your points that you brought up about basketball over the years, you would get laughed out of the room if Kobe Bryant was sitting there next to you. He would be, he would turn around and look at you. For as smart as you think you are at basketball, there have been a lot of smart basketball minds that have said a lot of the shit you say is stupid. Jerry West, Dominique Wilkins, and a lot of other great players have said a lot of the stuff that you say is flat out ignorant. So help me figure it out. Are you the greatest basketball player? Are you the gatekeeper of basketball? Because there are a lot of guys within your profession that disagree with you vehemently. <sighs> JJ Redick is fresh off of a rant on ESPN First Take yesterday. Because he's tired of the way sports media is being conducted. He's tired of people not giving every single NBA player all of the credit in the world. And he and he just went up there to basically whine and moan and complain and cry and all of these stuff. And as a matter of fact, for those of you who didn't hear some of the comments from JJ Reddick on ESPN first take, we want to play some of for you some of it for you now. Uh, and then we're going to come back and continue on the show. Take a listen to some of the things that J.J. Redick had to say on ESPN First Take yesterday. question is, does he get the credit he deserves? I think as a basketball player, Stephen, I think you're right. I think he does get the credit he deserves, but there's always a but attached to it because of the decision. Um, you know, I, I talked about this in 2016, right after he chose to go to the Warriors, and I was a fan of that move, and I was on the Clippers and had to go compete against the Warriors. I knew our championship window was closed the second he signed that contract. But I was still a fan of the move because I believe players, they get, they get drafted, serve their rookie contract, play the five years. He gave nine years, nine great years to Oklahoma City. He had the right to pursue whatever was going to make him happy at the time, just like he had the right after the Warriors run to pursue whatever was going to make him happy at the time. We are athletes. We have a finite amount of time to enjoy this ride. I had no problem with it. I have no problem, actually, with any decision he's made. Steph Curry is one of the greatest players of all time. This is not me pitting Kevin Durant against Steph Curry. The reality is in the 17 finals, the 18 finals, Kevin Durant was the best player on the floor. 
He was the best player on the floor. There's a reason he won those finals MVPs. 35, 8, and 5, and 17. 56 percent 47 percent from three 29 11 and eight assists in 18 53 percent 41 percent he was the best player to me he, he doesn't get the credit he deserves as a defensive player these last few seasons he's been phenomenal on that end he doesn't get the credit he deserves because of his decision making which everyone wants to critique his decision making I don't necessarily think that's fair I don't and you can, you can have qualms here about his decision to team up with Kyrie and Brooklyn. Here's the reality. They were a James Harden injury, a Kyrie injury, and a toenail away, away from probably winning the 21 NBA Finals. Facts. That's the Facts. reality. And there's – look, NBA history is littered with what-ifs. Littered with what-ifs. On the leadership front, not everybody leads the same way. Are you, have you been in a locker room with Kevin Durant? I, here's what I know about Kevin Durant. I know that Kevin Durant leads by example. I know the way he approaches his craft. This is a guy that lives, breathes, eats, sleeps basketball. That's a form of leadership. Now I want to address Stephen A's point. Since when is it players' jobs to educate people on basketball? When did that become a thing? When did that become a thing? Isn't that our job? Isn't that our job? I'll answer. I'll I do answer that as my I'm, job. I'm, I'm, That's I'm, my job I'm, to educate I'm, people I'm on letting, basketball. I'm letting you speak, and no, then I, I'll I'm, answer. I'm, I, I'm, it's our job, Stephen A., to educate mm -hmm. people on basketball. It's okay. our job. And here's the reality. This is the okay. ecosystem we live in. I can do okay. a video on my podcast. I can do a video on my podcast where I break down the last nine games the Pelicans have used Zion Williamson as the primary ball handler and what type of actions that has led to. I looked it up this morning. 54,000 views on YouTube. But I want to call out a coach yesterday – Oh, that gets tens of millions of engagements. That's the ecosystem we live in. So do fans actually want to be educated or not? Mm -hmm. Do they? Mm -hmm. Okay, can I respond? Of course you can. It's your show. Thank you so much. First of all, <clears throat> a couple of things, because um, I'm glad you promised your wife that you wouldn't yell and that you broke your promise to her. So plan on going home and explaining the fact that you just violated, you know, what you promised your wife. So at, 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 at about 10 minutes into the show. So that's number one. But that's a personal problem. And I'm sure you'll handle it. Number two, when you talk about his job to educate, nobody said it was his job. But the fact of the matter is what you're what you're highlighting is something that indirectly, if not directly, you've lamented for quite a long time. And you're going to have to get over that, J.J. Just like, Jay, just like Kevin Durant has the right to play. Let me finish. He has the right to play. And he also has the right to keep his thoughts to himself. So you heard what he had to say. J.J. is getting to the point where he's beginning to turn off a lot of people. Because he's acting like a know-it-all. And he's acting like as if the way he views sports media should be the standard and it should be the way that people conduct sports media. For whatever reason, that's how he feels. This is the same J.J. Redick that sat up there and said, Larry Bird and all of those guys weren't great shooters. The era that those guys played and Bob Cousy and them were playing with a bunch of firemen and, and firemen. And he said that the 90s wasn't a very physical era. We talk about the freedom of movement in the NBA today. So what is the inverse of freedom of movement? Lack of movement. So how do you accomplish that? Aren't there going to be a lot of people touching and grabbing and pulling and all of that? Wouldn't that wouldn't that constitute a more physical basketball game? That's what JJ Reddick said. And Hall of Famer top 75 player called his comments idiotic. That's Dominique Wilkins. And oh, by one of the greatest team builders in the history of the NBA, Jerry West, also questioned JJ Reddick's basketball IQ. This is the guy that's running around explaining basketball to everybody like as if he's Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant. So what happened? He goes on his rant. And after his rant, Nick Wright, who we almost never agree with, takes to his social media yesterday to call out J.J. Redick. He put up a post that generated 1.5 million views. And I want to read what, uh, what Nick Wright had to say. He said, I totally understand folks who aren't into televised sports discussion slash debate. It's not for everyone. I will never understand someone who is incredibly wealthy opts into working in the space and then simply uses the platform to complain about how useless slash dumb the space is that was nick wright reacting to jj reddick and here's why i want to agree with nick wright 
JJ Reddick is always whining and moaning and complaining about something. Always. If you look at the reaction between him, Stephen A. Smith, and uh, Chris Mad Dog Russo, he was furious. The question is why? The, the, the question is why? Kevin Durant goes out there, he talks about do people, whether or not people are giving him the proper amount of credit for his leadership. Fantastic. Stephen A. Smith reacts and says, no, you're getting the appropriate amount of credit that you deserve. That's his opinion. Chris Mad Dog Russo then goes out there and says, if we're talking about leaders, we're talking about Larry Bird. And I don't view myself as a leader. And oh, by the way, Kevin Durant himself has said, I don't view myself as a leader. They have their positions. JJ Reddick then JJ, JJ Reddick then comes in and starts hollering and complaining and screaming and shouting and all of that for absolutely no good reason. Here's something that is worth uh, bringing up. We had a lot of high expectations for JJ Reddick before he came into the sports media space. We produced the show on it, giving him his credit. But quickly, I found out that all he was up there to do was basically apologize for every single thing players do. He was really, really afraid to take any position against players that would that, that that would be in opposition to them. He was petrified to take a position. That's number one. Number two, we also noticed that whenever he brought players onto his show, he would never really ask them the tough questions. Really. And the biggest example of that was when Ben Simmons came on his show to basically turn himself into a victim and there was no pushback. Well, a lot of journalists who have been doing this stuff longer than all of us have been questioning a lot of athletes who have their own shows who are rarely willing to push back on their guests. We're not talking about their panelists. We're talking about the guests that they bring to their show. Where all too often what happens is they come on there and they try to appease them and they essentially agree with every single thing that they say. This happens on many, many different occasions. But now it seems like we're getting to the point where various voices in sports are beginning to get turned off by JJ's constant whining and complaint. Why he does it, I don't know. The rant that he had on ESPN yesterday was absolutely unnecessary. Talking about why do why do why do why do hot takes and all of this stuff uh, generate views and all of that stuff? I, I, bro, where 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 are you at? What where are you at? Where do you live? Where where are you? What are you watching? What have you been noticing about sports media over the last twenty years? And it's something that journalists and athletes do. All the time. Skip Bayless goes at LeBron James. It's a hot take. Uh, 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 what is it? Um, uh, uh, what is it? Gilbert Arena says Michael Jordan, the greatest player, the Edward Dines. It's a hot take. They're all doing it. But to JJ, it's this big mystery. We want to sit down. Why don't we sit down and discuss the X's and O's? Because you've ever, you've seen an NBA fan attend a basketball game because they want to watch the X's and O's. Or I turn on an NBA game because I want to, I want to be entertained. If you want to open up a basketball school, open up a basketball school and people are going in and, and go do that. Most people use these sports as a form of entertainment. And at the heart of it, it is entertainment. We're back here talking about some more Scottie Pippen, Michael Jordan, Chicago Bulls drama. As you guys know, the Chicago Bulls were arguably the greatest dynasty uh, in the history of the NBA, having multiple three-peats. Um, having a 72, 72 and 10 team and then having the greatest player uh, to ever play the sports, the sport, excuse me, be a part of it. But then what happened uh, in, the, uh, in 2020, they dropped the Last Dance docuseries. Um, and when that docuseries came out, it became the most viewed sports documentary docuseries in the history of sports. Um, and it sent and, and it just basically caused all type of friction and drama between Michael Jordan and his former teammate Scottie Pippen and it turned into this nasty uh you know not back and forth really just this, this campaign from Scottie Pippen to do everything in his power uh to tear down Michael Jordan but it really started on the Dan Patrick show when Scottie Pippen basically went on the Dan Patrick show and accused um Phil Jackson of being a racist and then took it a step further and basically said Michael Jordan was fake and he was using all of those moments by controlling the cameras and all of that for those of you who don't remember Scottie Pippen's initial initial salvo where he kicked off this entire thing, I want to play it for you now just to kind of refresh your memory and then want to come back and continue on the show. Take a listen to some of the things that Scottie Pippen initially has said about Michael Jordan. Help me understand the GQ article where you talked about the 1994 playoff game when you refused to go back in the game and Phil set up the play for Tony Kukoc. Well, I mean, it's not much to be said if you go back and look at 
when Scottie Pippen entered the Bulls and when Tony Kukoc entered the Bulls and who deserved the last shot of the game. No, no, no. I understand that, Scotty. I'm just going by what you said. You said you need to read between the fine lines. And then you go on to say it was a racial move to give him, Tony Kukoc, a rise. So, well, I mean, if you knew that Scotty Pippen had been with the Bulls from 87, battled through the Pistons and every other team that we had to get to those three championships, wouldn't you give Scotty Pippen one opportunity to get a last second shot without Michael Jordan? Like one year without Michael Jordan, can I get one shot? Like I'm doing all the dirty work. But all of that, I understand from the basketball standpoint, but when so, you say a racial move. Well, why would, why would Tony, who was a rookie, get the last second shot and you put me out of bounds? That's what I mean, racial. Like that was Scottie Pippen's team. But but Scottie Phil Pippen then, was but, but, on pace to be an MVP that year, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, why would you put him in a position not to be successful? Why wouldn't you put him in a position to succeed? Michael Jordan is not there. So who's next in line for you? But have you talked to Phil about this? Because by saying a racial move, then you're you're calling Phil. A racist. I don't got a problem with that. Do you think Phil was or is? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, do you remember Phil Jackson left the Lakers, went, wrote a book on Kobe Bryant, and then came back and coached him? I mean, who would do that? You name someone in professional sports that would do that. You know? I well, think he tried to expose Kobe in a way that he shouldn't have. You're the head coach. And you're the guy that sits in the locker room and tells the players, this is a circle and everything stays within the circle because that's what team is about. But you as the head coach open it up and now you go out and you try to belittle at that time, probably one of the greatest players in the game. Well, it feels like he's disloyal. I don't know if that makes him a racist. Well, that's your way of putting it out and I have my way. I was in the locker room with him. I was in practices with him. Uh, you're looking for him afar. Yeah, and and look, that's why I wanted to have you on. But I go back and Phil designed a play for Steve Kerr when Mike was <clears> there. And Mike Mike didn't have a problem with that, did he? I don't, I don't want to see, you're not you're you're not setting me up to answer the right question. What do you mean, Phil? set up a play for Steve Kerr. He didn't set that play for Steve Kerr. He set that play for Michael Jordan. I thought in the huddle, Mike says, I'm going to throw you the ball. You'll be open at the foul line. That, and Phil had nothing to do with that? Man, you don't want to get this show started because it'll take us a long time. Do you know all those cameras that's sitting in that huddle who they was working for? The NBA. So you know who Michael was speaking to when he said that, right? <laughs> that was That was planned. That was speaking to the to the camera. That wasn't speaking out of what we're going to have to do, what the play is going to be. That was speaking to the camera. Had John had uh, John Stockton not came down, trust me. <laughs> but that was building his own documentary because he knew he was controlling the cameras. So you heard, so you heard what he had to say, and then from that point forward, it just kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse and then Stephen A. Smith reported on ESPN first take that the bridge between Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen uh, had been burned down to the ground and then things took a turn for the weird when we then found out that Michael Jordan's son was planning to marry Scottie Pippen's ex-wife which was just beyond messy and disgusting but now we're hearing that um that, that relationship has probably come to a close so what happened yesterday I was doing some research and I came across an article that was published on Bleacher Report on February 24th, uh, 2024, and it had the following headline. It says, Scottie Pippen, more Bulls, start no bull tour to talk Michael Jordan, last dance. It continues, Scottie Pippen is taking the last dance on the road. Pippen, Luke Longley, and Horace Grant partnered with Australia's National Basketball League to announce a tour called No Bull, which will feature the former NBA players discussing Michael Jordan and the 1990 Chicago Bulls. The tour will begin on February 23rd and then head to Melbourne and Sydney. 
Pippen was the mainstay next to Jordan in the in, in Chicago, serving as his second in command for the six championship. Grant played uh, with the Bulls from 1987 to 1984, serving as the enforcer for the Chicago's first three P. While Longley joined in 1994 and was the big man in the middle in the second three P from 1996 to 1999. Um, and then the article then goes on to say a few more things. So it looks like Scottie Pippen and these guys have now decided that they're going to take this show on the road to continue the Michael Jordan uh, slander. Um, I think that Scottie going at Michael Jordan has really hurt him long term. He, he's lost a lot of supporters along the way, especially for some of the crazy things that he said about Michael Jordan and all that. The last one I think he said was that Michael Jordan wasn't a good basketball player. And uh, he, yeah, he wasn't a dynamic basketball player and he only became good when he came, when he came, all kind of crazy stuff. Now, is anyone disputing uh, the contributions that Scottie Pippen had to the Chicago Bulls run? No, but what has happened is I've seen a lot of Chicago Bulls fans who witnessed that run begin to turn on Scotty. Literally, we produced a ton of shows about it and I read through the comments and a lot of them, uh, a lot of them are, are um, pretty disappointed in the direction that Scottie Pippen uh, has taken. And the thing has just gotten so ugly. If to be quite frank with you, it's, it's gotten really, really ugly, ugly and nasty, especially with the Marcus Jordan, Larsa Pippen um, aspect of it. It's, it's, it's been pretty bad. My question is simply this. Scottie Pippen, if you go back and listen to the comments that he made on the Dan uh, uh, Patrick show and some of the things that he said subsequently, Scottie Pippen was referring to things that occurred when him and Michael Jordan were teammates. My only problem was, if you felt this way about Michael Jordan, why were we seeing you in various pictures and events with Michael Jordan hugging it up and kumbaya it up? And as a matter of fact, why did you even participate in the Last Dance docuseries if you thought that little of Michael Jordan? If you thought it was this, he was this bad person, why, why were you willing to even be connected to the guy? Well, you saw an opportunity to make some money, and you did. And, it, and then you sold a book. You made a lot of money selling that book, talking about Jordan. And here you are going to have another tour and you ain't going to be doing it for free. And you're still going to be making more money, money off of Michael Jordan. And I think that's the reason why Scottie Pippen has lost some of his once loyal followers. They're like, bro, what, what, what are we doing here? And it's, it's a really a shame because this is one of the greatest sports duos, um, greatest sports runs ever. And to see it kind of end the way that it's ending, uh, it, it's a real shame.